Amen. If everybody would grab their song, but we are going to turn to 115. No, not one, number 115. I've, this song has really grown on me. I've enjoyed this song. It's a fun song to sing, but as we're going through it, I, want to, I challenge you to consider some of the words that you're singing, some of the questions that you see. Was there a gift like the Savior given? No, not one. All right, we're going to sing it out nice and loud. Number 115, shout it out. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Not else could heal all our souls. Thanks, Gal. Appreciate that, Tom. All right, First Kings tonight. We're going to chapter twenty. We're um, we're just a couple weeks out here from being done, so it uh, always seems to go by so quickly. But um, yeah, tonight is twenty. Next week, twenty-one. Uh, then twenty-two. The following week, and that should take us to uh, April thirteenth. And I have. Um, April, yeah, April 13th, April 20th is um, uh, John Woodward, missionary uh, Romania. John Woodward will be with us uh, to report on a, another upcoming trip that he has. So, And then we'll be into uh, pulpit fill at that point. So, and then it'll be, you know, the messages are always good from that. And we'll pick up Second Kings in uh, the fall. All right, just going to continue on in the second Kings. So, First Kings twenty. Now, just to review, we spent the last couple weeks on Elijah the prophet and uh, his um, contest, if you will, with Baal um, and winning that on uh, Mount Carmel and defeating the four hundred fifty prophets of Baal and killing them. And and then in uh, last chapter, he of course coming off of a high and the queen, um, uh, not not the king, not Ahab, but the queen Jezebel, 
uh, sends him a messenger and says, I'm going to kill you. When I find you, I'm going to kill you. And that kind of sent him into a tailspin, sent him into depression. And, you know, sometimes bad news when we're not expecting it can just send us into, into things like that. And here's a prophet who was probably pretty tired. And the Lord uh, took care of him, sent an angel and fed him and uh, sent him out to sent him up to uh, Mount Hor- Horeb or Sinai. And then they had a conversation and Elijah came um, clean with his emotions and saying, you know, I've done this, done that. Why is it? Why why me? Why me? Why me? And, um, you know, whenever we, uh, I think whenever we stop to ask that, my pastor used to say, why not me? And that's such a good point. It's like, what's different about you than any other person in the human race? You know what I mean? So. Uh, why me? Well, sometimes it's just our turn. You know, it's not easy to accept, but sometimes there's not really a deep answer to why things do happen the way that they do. Uh, It's just none of us really like that. So Elijah, a man of like passions, right? He was really, really uh, going through it. And then the Lord basically says at the end of that chapter, um, go anoint Elisha to be the next prophet and um, anoint the king of Syria, the next king of Syria, the next king of Israel and all that. So um, so that was pretty much that. And he did. And he the last time last we saw him at the end is um, he went over to Elisha and threw his mantle on him and all that. Now, chapter 20, there's no we're, we're, we're changing, shifting gears, shifting back to Ahab. Chapter 21 is going to be the, the next time in this book, and the last time in this book that we see Elijah uh, with Naboth's vineyard, and that will be the next time. And then from there, it's pretty quiet. He'll transition out uh, in Second Kings, um, the early chapters, and then turn it over to Elisha. Um, so, but chapter 20 comes back to uh, King Ahab. Remember, wicked king, bad king, married to Jezebel, um, you know, who was the daughter of a satanic priest and all that. And this is going to be a a battle, basically, that he has, that Ahab has, with the king of Syria. And you're going to see some things like the character. You pick up things like the character revealed of, of Ahab. And and you we're going to pick up like the mercy of God, how God is actually going to be like, uh, hey, I'm on your side, you know, kind of a thing. You could just see God's heart for Israel through this. And, uh, you know, and then from there, um, you know, it, it, it ends up where Ahab once again disappoints. You know, so it's like, like the cycle. So, so chapter 20 is going to be just, you know, going to be a lot of, a lot of reading here just to, to, to see what the narrative is. Um, chapter 20, verse 1, it says, And Ben Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together. And there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. Now Samaria is northern Israel, um, where kind of uh, the capital of, you know, the northern tribes. So now Ben-Hadad, this is one of three Ben-Hadads mentioned in Scripture because the name just means son of Hadad, who Hadad was a Syrian god of storms. So the kings were like, I'm son of the god of storms. You know, I'm Ben-Hadad. I'm the, I'm the son of the, the Syrian god. You know, that kind of a thing. So, um, but that's what they refer to each of them as, just Ben-Hadad. And you can see the pay, that's they're very pagan. Okay? But, what they have in common with Ahab is he was very pagan as well. Okay, so, but they're they they're going to war just like everybody else likes to go to war with Israel. It's not anything different that's ever happened. And uh, but he's got thirty two kings with him, uh, horses, chariots. All right, verse two it says, and he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city, and said unto him, Thus saith Ben Hadad. Thy silver and thy gold is mine. 
thy wives also and thy children, even the goodliest are mine. So he's got the city surrounded. And this is the message to uh, Ahab. Don't surrender. It's just, I'm taking your silver. I'm taking your gold. I'm taking your wives. I'm taking your children. Now you would think that the guy, the man says, oh no, you're not. Oh no, you're not. That's not what he says. Verse 4, And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. Can you imagine that? What a horrible character. Now, I get it that Jezebel was his wife. So he's like, yeah, you can have her first. You know, yeah, I, 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 get, I, get, I get that part, you know. But, I mean, he's just like, no, no, man. He's like, all right, yeah, my, my lord, O king. This guy's probably afraid for his life. He doesn't want to die. He just wants to comply with everything, you know. Uh, it's just kind of a strange scenario. Verse 5, And the messengers came again and said, Thus speaketh Ben-Hadad, saying, Although I have sent unto thee, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver and thy gold and thy wives and thy children, yet I will send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall search thine house and the houses of thy servants, and it shall be that whatsoever is pleasant in mine eyes, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. All right, so you can tell that the, the ego of Ben-Hadad, which is, I'm coming for you, and I'm coming for your family. And he expected, a, oh no, please don't, or expected a resistance, or expected something. He expected a rise out of Ahab, and he got, okay. Well, then he's like, that's not good enough. I want, I want a different response from you. <laughs> so I'm coming for everything. All right, I'm coming for everything. I'm coming to, in verse 6, uh, whatever is pleasant in thine eyes. I'm taking all your toys away. So um, I guess it's like, because this did get his attention, I guess it was like asking for, uh, our creature comforts, I don't know. Our, our, our goods, our favorite things, our, 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 our sports, our vacations, our entertainment. I don't know, man. You know, I mean, it's just like this one rung his bell, though. Not his wife and kids, but his stuff. You know, I'm coming for your stuff. And um, I always said this during, um, during things like when the government push, push, push. And we're going through the whole COVID thing. I always said, I think people will comply until they take your stuff. I, I just feel like Americans are kind of wired that way. Like, okay, you know what I want? You want that? You sure? I'll do this. You want me? Yeah, okay. But when they start coming for your stuff, I think people are going to be like, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, this is my, you can't have my house. You can't, you know, you can't have my stuff. You know, I think that's, Maybe when we'll see a little more, a little more resistance. I don't know, but I just that was kind of my mentality. It was like I think it's because they still can have their incomes and their vacations and their stuff. I, I think that's why everybody just kind of gave up so easily. But he's like, no, you're not having this stuff. Verse seven. Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh mischief. For he sent unto me for my wives, and for my children, and for my silver, and for my gold, and I denied him not. He's being honest. So he calls the elders. I think he's going he to have to try to get their support to you know, go up against this guy. In verse 8 it says, And all the elders and all the people said unto him, Hearken not unto him, nor consent. So they're like, no, we're not doing this. No, tell him no. Wherefore he said unto the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king, All that thou didst send for to thy servant at the first I will do. But this thing I may not do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. Again, I can't get over the character of this man. You want my family? Done. You want my stuff? Uh Uh-uh. Isn't that crazy? This is crazy. So, but, but no, this, you've gone too far, man. You're asking for, you know, uh, uh, you know, my, my coin collection. I don't know, whatever it is. 
and uh, brought him word again. Verse 10. And Ben-Hadad sent unto him and said, The gods do so unto me and more also, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people that follow me. And he basically, I'm going to come in and whoop you, and I'm going to take these people, and you're done. This is a done deal. Now, I do like the response here, because this is good advice. And the king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. He's saying, don't count your chickens before they hatch, right? He's saying, don't boast yourself like you're coming, like you'd finished war and you're taking your gear off before you have even put it on. So that's his way of standing up and saying, you really shouldn't boast like that. This is good advice, by the way, even though it comes from uh, Ben Hadad, (laughs) or uh, from Ahab. I I think it's good good advice for us uh, about boasting. You know, let's not not, uh, boast uh, of things that um, we haven't even yet done. You know, uh, boasting can get it, pride can get us in trouble. And... uh, you know, uh, especially, you know, if, if, you shouldn't, it's tough. Don't, don't, bo- people that boast about themselves, everybody can see right through that. And, you know, it's, it never really goes over well with people, you know, because you're like, hey, I can't believe he's boasting about himself. You know, I mean, what kind of ego is this? What kind of, what kind of person talks about himself? Now, if somebody else toots your horn and boasts about you and says you're great and, you know, that's, you know, that's their thing, man, you know, but you don't, you don't have to do that. So, but boasting in scripture is interesting. Proverbs 27, one says, boast not thyself of tomorrow for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Isn't that great advice though? Isn't that great advice? Any day something could just go horribly wrong. Your life can be flipped up in a moment's time upside down. So there's good advice to taking that one day at a time, but don't boast of thyself. Like, oh, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do great things here, and I'm gonna, I, and I don't know. I just take one day at a time because I don't know what a day may bring forth. Psalms 44.8, even better yet. In God we boast all the day long and praise thy name forever, Selah. That's where we should be boasting, right? Now that one you can boast all day long, any day. Okay, that one you can't lose. (laughs) You can't lose that one. So in God we boast all the day long. Now Paul in Second Timothy four, Paul definitely did not boast about anything until he took his armor off, and that's the advice here. Hey, don't boast until you're done in the battle and take your armor off. And of course Paul says, "I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith." Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also <coughs> that excuse me, that love his appearing. So this is a crown of righteousness that he's earned um, and is available for anybody who loves the Lord's appearing. But he says he's going to boast a little bit here, but it's true. I I don't know if it's boasting if it's true. You know, he finished his course. He did. He did fight a good fight, you know, and he did keep the faith, right? And uh, now because of that, I am able to, you know, get rewarded. But at least Paul didn't, didn't do that. You know, I tell the story before, but uh, Moody talks about a story of the preachers, the young preachers that he trained. And he talks about a young preacher who uh, thought, he was full of himself and got up there and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, just knock these people over with my message and I'm going to be great. And, and uh, he flopped. He stunk. Which I have to tell you, I know the feeling. He stunk. And he came down all dejected from the pulpit. And Moody said to him, Son, if you would have went up 
the way that you came down, it would have been an entirely different situation. And that's so true. You don't go up, boss. You go up humbly and fearful, <laughs> you know. And then God would have blessed his humility, and then he would have come down feeling a lot better about the message, you know. Because, uh, you know, we can't do things in our flesh and boast like we're going to do these great things. Um, boast about God all the day long. That's where we want to, that's where our boasting should come in. You know, if you do anything, if you're blessed, I mean, if you do anything well, hey, oh, I love the way you do this. Uh, your family's wonderful and beautiful, and I like the message you preach, and boy, you know, you have a great spirit about you. Praise the Lord. Right? Praise the Lord. I mean, none of us have anything without Him. <laughs> you know, it's just so true. Anything that we've done right or well should really all glory to God for that, you know. All glory to God. So ben Hadad is boasting, and Ahab says, not so fast, buddy. Verse 12 of our text. And it came to pass when Ben-Hadad heard this message as he was drinking, and he and the kings in the pavilions, that he said unto his servants, Set yourselves in array, and they set themselves in array against the city. So he's kind of just, he's partying essentially with the other 32 kings. And he says, go get them, go get them boys. And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Now, I love how God deals with these people, because he's always trying. Isn't that something about the character of God? Even when you start to walk away or whatever, he's always trying to pull you back, right? And man, this is a heathen pagan king, but he's the king of Israel. So God's like, hey, I got, this is what we're going to do, and you're going to know that I'm the Lord. All right, he's trying to pull him back. And Ahab said, by whom? This is faithless Ahab. He's not walking with God. He's a pagan king. He uses pagan gods. Uh, what do you mean? Who's going to do this? And he said, thus saith the Lord, even by the young men of the princes of the provinces. Then he said, well, who shall, who, who shall order the battle? And he answered, thou, dummy. Well, you're the king. You're the commander-in-chief. You order the battle, Joe. You order the battle. You know, <laughs> Wake up. So he, uh, he's just not in tune with God. But God says, I'm going to do something here. Then he numbered the young men of the princes of the provinces, and they were 232. And after them he numbered all the people, even all the children of Israel, being 7,000. Not a whole lot there. And they went out at noon. Now I don't know if this was strategic. If this was not like a common time to attack. I, I, I imagine that it was, it was, there was a reason for it. But look what happens. But Ben, but ben Hadad was drinking himself drunk. In the pavilions, he and the kings, the 30 and two kings that helped him. So you have um, 33 drunk kings and they attack. That's a good time to attack. Great time to attack. Verse 17. And the young men of the, the princes of the provinces went out first and Ben-Hadad sent out and they told him saying, there are men come out of Samaria. And he said, whether they be come out for peace, take them alive, or whether they be come out for war, take them alive. I, I, I think he's like, this is going to be easy. Just take them alive, don't worry about it. This isn't going to be, this is going to be uh, a piece of cake here. So these young men of the princes of the provinces came out of the city and the army which followed them. And they slew everyone his man. And the Syrians fled, and Israel pursued them, and Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, escaped on a horse with the horsemen, which i got to believe that you've got 33 drunken slob kings trying to run away on a horse, trying to get away. Being like, man, this is, this is serious now. You know, That had to be a sight to see that. 
In verse 21, And the king of Israel went out and smote the horses and chariots and slew the Syrians with a great slaughter. Just like God said. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go, strengthen thyself, and mark, and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come up against thee. So the prophet says, all right, hey, go return. Uh, check, make sure you know where everybody's at. Don't be caught off by surprise. They're going to come back again. And so he's getting, you know, more marching orders. And, um, you know, surely they're going to come. They're going to come back for you. And the servants of the kings of Syria said unto him, their gods are gods of the hills. I love when people say stuff like this in, in, in front of God. Therefore, they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. So they're trying to, to talk Ben-Hadad into like, uh, well, this is why we lost. Nothing to do with God, of course. Right? And uh, they said, well, their gods are the gods of hills and, and they're stronger than us, but we need to fight them in the plain. We need to get off the hills and fight them in the plain. Uh, you know, we could fight them on our ground. Then we'll be stronger than they. Verse 24, And do this thing, take the kings away and every man out of his place and put captains in their rooms. Probably good military advice. Get your fat, drunken, slob kings out of the way and put captains in their rooms. You know, let's get some some real military people here, you know. And uh but it's going to fail anyway because it's not of God. And it really again, they sh- there's no way that they should have lost to Israel. Verse 25, and number thee an army like the army that thou hast lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot. And we will fight against them in the plain. And surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice and did so. And it came to pass at the return of the year that Ben-Hadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. Just what God says. He's going to come back and do this again. And sure enough, he, that's exactly what he's done. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them, and the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrian filled the country. <laughs> it's like the Syrians got the place filled. They come out like two little, two little flocks. <laughs> you know, two, two, two little flocks, you know, of like sheep out there amongst all of these, all of these uh, armies. So again, they're outnumbered so this is another yet another david and goliath another gideon's 300 right another if you know history the six day war uh in 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 jerusalem so it's it's another one of those things if god is in it numbers don't matter numbers don't matter we've seen this over and over And uh, verse 28, And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but He is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. (sighs) Mistake, big mistake. You don't ever say, when God is in something, that it's not going to work. And he was, you know what I find fascinating about this? He was listening intently to the heathen. What did they say? I'm not the God of what? He's going to show them. So, when any, when any, Listen, any of these leaders, man, I just wait. I just always wait for a world leader to say something stupid against God. 
Because I go, oh, his days are numbered. I love it. <laughs> you just made a big mistake right there, you know. And, and a lot of times they have it, and their days are always numbered, right? So, um, or, you know, you in your own life, in, in your own life, you say, well, the Lord, uh, the Lord's leading me this way. I know this is what I'm supposed to do. And people go, oh, I don't think you should do that, bro. That's not going to work, you know. I know the Lord's leading me that way. That's all God has to hear is that there's naysayers, okay? We talk about that all the time here over the 10 years of, of this facility and this property and the matter, many times over, yeah, oh, no, Randy will tell you how many projects and things. It's like, no, you can't do that. It's not possible. And I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure that's what God's telling me to do, so that's what we're going to do, and we do, you know, because you you said we can't. Thank you for that, by the way, when you say we can't. So, um, and this is much, obviously, a much more serious situation, but he says, um, uh, because they said this, I'll deliver you. And he is not the God of the valleys. He took exception to that, right? He's not the God of the valleys. I love this. Song of Solomon 2 1 I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Not the God of the valleys. What? This is another great one. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You're, he's in the valley with you. You know, folks, listen. This is life. I'm up, oh, I'm up on the mountaintop. It's so great. I'm down in the valley. Not so great. He's there. Just like he was up there, he's down there. It doesn't matter. I, I walk through the valley of the shadow. Of, of all the valleys to walk through, the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That is a great verse of comfort. Great verse of comfort when it's time, when it's time to die. God is the God of good times and bad times, the mountains and the valleys, and uh, there's no coincidences, no accidents for us and the things that happen. And, you know, um, you know, we can't... If you're a Christian, if you're saved, you, you can't just think that um, I, I'll be spiritual on Sunday, but, you know, tomorrow I, I won't be, you know. It's not like He doesn't come with you. You know, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, God's the God of the church, the churches, but He's not the God of, like, the bars. He's not the God of, you know, uh, of, of, of me doing wrong or doing evil, doing somebody bad at work, or, you know. It, he's with you. Because you're a Christian, so He's with you. I like, you know, don't be found going, He's not the God of the valleys. No. He's there. He's always present. So, that's why that was the, the Lord's like, they're going to know, you're going to know, I'm the Lord. And they pitched one over against the other seven days, and so it was that in the seventh day the battle was joined, and the children of Israel slew the Syrians, a hundred thousand footmen in one day. Now, I don't know how God does this, because I can't wait to see all this play out. How did you do that? What did you do? Did you give them super strength? Did you make them fall in holes? You know, did you take them away with a wind? Uh, did the earth swallow them up? You know, wh- how'd you do that? You know, well, he did it. He did it. It'll, it'll be interesting to to see all that stuff that we don't know the details about. Hundred thousand, verse thirty. But the rest fled to Aphek into the city. And there a wall fell upon twenty and seven thousand of <laughs> of the men that were left. And Ben Hadad fled and came into the city into an inner chamber. Oh, these guys are like, man, I'm glad I escaped that. Ooh, a wall kills twenty seven thousand. Oops. Guess you didn't get get out like you wanted. So the king Ben Hadad hides himself in an inner chamber, probably a you know a secret room or whatever. And his servant said unto him, Behold now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. 
Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads and go out to the king of Israel. Peradventure, he will save thy life. Hey, we got nothing to lose. Let's go. We heard they're merciful. In other words, you heard that they were soft. <laughs> you know, uh, you heard that they don't finish the job. You know, so the sackcloth, we're going to put sackcloth on as a sign of repentance. The ropes that are going to tie around their heads or whatever is a sign of captivity. You know, everything was symbolism. You know, we're going to come and we're going to say, hey, man, we're, we're yours. We're yours. In verse 32, So they girded sackcloth on their loins, put ropes on their heads, and came to the king of Israel and said, Thy servant Ben-Hadad saith, I pray thee, let me live. And he said, Is he yet alive? He is my brother. Do you believe that? (laughs) He's your brother. He wanted to destroy you and the whole nation and take all your stuff. And he goes, is he yet alive? I figured he was dead. He's my brother. Um, I have to say, though, he was his spiritual brother, right? Ahab was followed the pagan Assyrian gods, and so did Ben-Hadad. They were. They were the same, so to speak. And there's there's an element of there's there's a weird element of respect that goes with like Russia and China. Russia and China are going to come together because they're brothers. They've got that communism. They've got that evil about them. They, they're going to come together. Weird. And oh, he's alive. He's my brother. He ain't heavy. <laughs> so so verse 33 now the men did diligently observe whether anything would come from him and did hastily catch it and they said thy brother ben Hadad, he's my brother and they were like oh 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 this is a great we couldn't have done this any better Ye- Thy brother Ben Hadad, you know that, that's what they, they must have gone. He goes, "Is he alive? He's my brother." And they probably went, "Thy brother Ben Hadad, he's alive, right?" And uh, then he said, "Go ye bring him." Then Ben Hadad came forth to him, and he caused him to come up into the chariot. Go get him. Tell him to come, come into my chariot. Let's let's chat here. Verse 34. And Ben-Hadad said unto him, The cities which my father took from thy father I will restore, and thou shalt make streets for thee in Damascus, uh, as my father made in Samaria. Then said Ahab, I will send thee away with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him and sent him away. Remember now, God's lurking and saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna defeat this guy for you. And you're gonna know that I'm the Lord. No such mention in this now of Ahab. And he makes a covenant with the heathen. And you're not supposed to do that with Israel, belong to God. And so you have, you know, the second Corinthians six principle of being not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, even though he was an unbeliever. Um, you know, Practically speaking, when God gives us a victory over something, don't return to the vomit. God gives you a victory over sin. Don't don't be the dog returning to the vomit. Go, God, deliver me from this. Oh, Lord, please. Oh, God, help me through this. Oh, Lord, forgive me. And he does. And then, oh, uh, yeah, okay, I'll just return back to it, right? That's a bad thing. Just bad advice. He made a covenant with him and sent him away. All right, this... This gets a little a little strange here, but this is God's going to send a prophet now. And, and a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor, in the word of the Lord, smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. So this guy, but he says it in it says he says it in the word of the Lord. Maybe maybe they were supposed to recognize when this guy's prophesying. But he walks up to a neighbor and says, hit me. 
And the man's like, no, you're the prophet. And sometimes God's word can sound strange, right? Be, being a prophet is not all glamour. You know what I mean? Um, uh, Isaiah 20, I think. Um, Isaiah, walk around naked. What? You're an illustration to Israel. They're going to shame the shame. You're going to have your buttocks uncovered and walk around naked as a symbol to Israel that they should be ashamed of themselves. Well, okay. Ezekiel 4. Ezekiel. Hey, Ezekiel. Protect, make this little play city of Jerusalem. Get an iron pan. That's going to be the iron wall. Play with it. Besiege it. Lay on your side for 390 days for each day a year that they've been disobedient. And then lay on your right side for 40. What? The life of the prophet was not all glamorous. <laughs> they did some strange things for, for illustration. Here's one of them. Punch me, hit me, smite me. No, I'm not doing it. Should have went with the program, buddy. Verse 36. Then said he unto him, Because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. I'm guessing, I'm just guessing, that this guy should have known that this was the voice of the Lord. Because he's accountable for this. Hey, Punch me, hit me, slap me, smite me. Oh. And he must have been, it must be that he knew that it was God, of God, because he, he's like, no, I'm not going to do it. He disobeyed and a lion eats him. I don't know, man. All I know is too many, too many Christians are eaten by lions because they don't obey the voice of the Lord. That I do know. That I do know. They don't obey God, they're eaten by lions. Verse 37. Then he found another man and said, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him. So then smiting, he wounded him. This guy probably knew what was going on. And he's like, okay, here it comes. You know, wind up. Bam. Bam. You know. And he, and he wounds him, which is exactly what they wanted for the illustration. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. Now he's sitting there waiting for Ahab to pass by. He disguises himself because he's a prophet that Ahab knew. And he puts ashes on his face. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king and he said, Thy servant went out, he's telling him a story. Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle and behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life. Or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. He gives him an illustration of really what happened with, between Ahab and Ben-Hadad. You had this man and you were supposed to keep him. He's telling him the story. And in verse 40, And as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. He, I was supposed to keep track of this guy and I was busy and, I left, and he left and now I'm, I can't find the guy. And the king said, the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be, thyself has decided it. Hey, you agreed to this. Judgment is on you, man. What do you want me to do about it? That's what he's saying. Okay, good. Uh, Ahab, we're glad you feel that way, because here comes uh, the, the punchline. And he hasted and took the ashes away from his face, and the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophets. Uh-oh. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. Well, that's exactly what happened later. In a couple chapters... His life was taken. In 1 Kings 22.37 So the king died and was brought to Samaria and they buried the king in Samaria and one washed the, the 
chariot in the pool of Samaria, and the dogs looked, looked up his blood, and they washed his armor according unto the word of the Lord which he spake. He doesn't, he doesn't die a very glamorous death. Well, because what happened? I, God says, I appointed this man to utter destruction. And you let him go. Your life for his life. That's what happened. And in verse 43, And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased and came to Samaria. He's a powder, this guy. This Ahab is a whiny hiney. He is a powder. All right? So he goes, oh, I can't believe it. <laughs> you know, all I did was, uh, you know. And then, because we're going to see next week, <laughs> when he can't have Naboth's vineyard, he starts to whine, do the same thing. Okay? But what I want to spend a few minutes here on, because we've, we've got it, is this. God appointed a king to utter destruction, and the actions of man messed up that appointment. Do you understand? The free will of man interfered with God's appointment. Now you tell me the free will of man is not powerful. The free will of man is powerful. God gives us that free will. And I say, I, I bring up these illustrations because I just thought this would be a good place. I appointed this man to destruction. You blew it. All right. So I thought, well, let's look at a couple, couple uh, biblical passages of this stuff. This is David and Samuel having a dialogue with God. And again, my point is to show you the power of making a decision, good or bad, okay? David says to the Lord, Thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to uh, Kilah, which is the city he was at hiding, to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Kilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O God, Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. He will. Then said David, Will the men of Kilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. So what is David going to do? Is he going to go, Well, that's it. I'm doomed. I'm just going to sit here and wait for it to happen. No. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Kilah and went with us wherever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Kilah and he forbear to go. So not only did David's actions prevent Saul from killing him, but he prevented him to come down and besiege the city. To de- he destroyed the city. The city spared because David simply made a decision to leave. Do you, uh, my point. Do you see how our actions can determine a better outcome or a worse outcome, right? This is inter- these are interesting passages here in Ezekiel 33. When I shall say God says, when I shall say to the righteous thou that he shall surely live. Now listen. God said to the righteous, you shall surely live. However, if he trusts his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousnesses shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity that he had committed, he shall die for it. Even though God said, hey, you're surely going to live. Well, he goes, went back on it and he says, oh, he's going to die for it. Opposite, again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. You're wicked. You will surely die. If he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, if the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. He, thou shall surely die. But he didn't. He lived. Again, actions determine consequences, right? Actions determine consequences. I'm, set, I'm setting this all up for, because we have time. And I thought it's a good way to illustrate 
Every so many years, this doctrine of Calvinism creeps into the church and just becomes this big issue. And we're cycling back into that. And so, Calvinism is essentially the free will of man. It's the sovereignty of God, and the free will has nothing to do with anything. God is going to tell you what He's going to tell you and basically say, uh, I appointed you to be saved, so you're saved. But I appointed you to be lost, so you're lost. Now, that just doesn't make sense to us. It doesn't to me. It shouldn't to you. Unless you have been brainwashed into this teaching called Calvinism. Okay? So I'm going to give you a quick lesson on it. There's five points of what's called hyper-Calvinism. Five points. Okay? And you remember them this way. Tulip. T-U-L-I-P. Tulip is are the five points of hyper-Calvinism. Now, it's called Calvinism because the man named John Calvin took this and ran with it and taught all of these this false doctrine. And where he got it from, anybody know who he got it from? Ever hear of Aurelius Augustine? That's way back in the 300 B.C. I mean A.D. 386 or whatever. He was he was a he was a good Catholic man. Augustine. Don't don't come to me with his writings, the City of God, and this and that and the other thing. The man was a lost Catholic. Why are, we, why are we so enamored with people who can, who can write? You're lost. So Augustine, Calvin gets his stuff from Augustine, and Calvin takes it and runs with it, and now the Calvinists of today take it and say, I dig this. Well, here it is in a nutshell, in simplicity. All right, This is what a hyper-Calvinist teaches. Five points of Calvinism. One is... Total depravity of man. Total depravity of man basically says man is so depraved that he cannot muster up the faith to call on the Lord to be saved. It has to be an appointment. God, God says, God says, you can't do this. I'm doing it. You don't have a say. Well, I read this. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Doesn't that like just say whosoever? Like anybody? Alright? Again, this is this is like overly simplistic, alright? But I'm telling you, you should know this stuff. Then there's you, which is called unconditional election. Again, in simple terms. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a soul by the toe. I mean... You're saved, you're saved, you're saved, you're not. You're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going, you're going to heaven, you're going to heaven. Unconditional election. God determined it. Well, there is the election, but not unconditional. 1 Peter 1 2 says, Elect Christians according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. What this says is, elect, yes, according to the foreknowledge. You know what foreknowledge is? He knew what you were going to do. He knew you were going to choose Him because the, the foreknowledge of under obedience, who obeys, we do. Okay? So it's not unconditional election. It's election according to the foreknowledge of God. Simple. Limited atonement. Limited atonement basically says Jesus died for just the saved. Okay? Just the elect. His blood atonement was for the elect. So therefore, it's limited atonement. Okay? You don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. And again, simply, for God so loved the world. Is that... The is, is that say love the Christian or the world? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, there it is again, 
whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He wants the world saved. No limited atonement. Next is irresistible grace, which says that a lost person who's been appointed to wrath that can't get saved, and somebody witnesses to them, they can resist. They can resist the power of the gospel. They can resist the grace of God. They can, they can resist because they're not elect. It's, it's uh, ir- irresistible grace is this, essentially. You have flip side of the argument, which is, um, which is if, if, a lo- if, a, a, if, if they're condemned to hell, eh, too bad. But if you're the elect, you can't resist because God's elected you. So essentially, again, you're violating the free will. Irresistible grace. You can't resist God's grace. You can't do it. All right. Well, well. Acts seven fifty one. Stephen was preaching and said, "You un, you stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart, in ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did. So do you. So can you resist the grace of God? Yeah, you can. Re, you can resist it. You can. Re, it's your free will. You can do it. Okay. You can resist it." The irresistible grace. Okay? That's what they teach. Well, once God's great, once you once you're little, you hear it, you can't resist it. How many times were any of you convicted and walked away before you got saved? Right? How many do you know? Uh, Melissa brought up somebody tonight. They're almost there. They're almost there. They're almost there. Well, they're not there, though, and they don't have to be there. Okay? So. Uh, this one is called Perseverance of the Saints. Perseverance of the Saints. You know, this is an interesting one because people define different things. Some people call it Preservation of the Saints, which is not that. It's called Perseverance of the Saints. Perseverance is not eternal security. Perseverance is more like anyone who's elected and saved will not backslide. They will persevere To the end. You know any Christians that have backslidden? You know what that means? That means by a Calvinist point of view that they weren't, they're they're not Christians. Well, here's the problem. Paul wrote to the Christians, you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Paul's like, hey church, straighten up. You're Christians, you should live better than this. So anyway, all right, that's TULIP. I'll just throw in a couple extra bonus ones um, if you ever care to, um, you know, present this or have to defend your position. Second Thessalonians 2.12, they, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. That's what damns them. God's election, or not, not election, doesn't damn them. They, they, they're damned because they believe not the truth but had pleasure in in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you, remember, predestination according to foreknowledge. But look at how He's chosen them. God from the beginning hath chosen you, Christian, to salvation. How? Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. You had to believe the truth, right? That's how you were chosen, because you believed the truth. 1 Timothy 2, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. How do you get around that? God wants all men to be saved. Um, 1 Timothy 4.10, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men. You could stop right there for a second. He is the Savior of all men. For God so loved the world. There's no limited atonement. And then it says, specially of those that believe. Specifically to those. He's the Savior of all men, but they all don't get in on it. And specifically to those that do believe. But He's the Savior of all men. It's there for everybody's taking. Everybody can take part of it. And some do. Some don't. Then, 
Second Peter 3 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I don't I don't see I can't I can't even entertain any of those five points. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so what did we read tonight? I appointed this guy to destruction and you let him go. Free will of man. Not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. What happened? They didn't repent. They said, nah, not going to do it. They rejected him. So anyway, I thought in context of this, we, I knew we were going to have a, little, a few minutes extra that I would just give you a quick lesson uh, on how to defend, you know, um, biblical salvation. You see, people say, "Are you are you a Calvinist or Arminian?" I'm neither, man. I'm a Bible believer. Don't don't give me don't label me after anybody any any man or any group. I'm a Bible believer. That's what I am. So anyway, what we believe, you know. So.